Hello and welcome to An Academy, a one-stop destination for all the English medium civil service aspirants. Welcome to another session of Economy Weekly Recap. And in this video, these are the most important economy related articles which have appeared in different business related newspapers. Now, before I start the discussion, a very important announcement. We are very happy to announce Conquer Prelims 2024 for the students who want to appear for upcoming civil services examination. The Conquer Prelims 2024 will have two components. One will be a static crash course and the second one will be current affairs crash course program. The static crash course will be conducted on an academy app or the platform and the current affairs will be conducted on our YouTube channel. The number of classes in the static will be 50. The timing will be every day 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. And the starting date for the static crash course will be 19th of April and will continue till 7th June 2024. And on the other hand, the current affairs, the timing will be live from 7.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. every day. And the duration will be from 1st May 2024 to 31st May 2024, which basically means there will be 31 classes under the current affairs crash course. Now, many of the students ask me, sir, how do we follow? There are two programs. How do we keep a track of it? For that, very simple solution. In case of the static crash course, there is a link which has been provided in the descriptive section of the video. Go to these, each of the links for the faculties, follow every faculty, that is English faculties, whenever the classes are scheduled, automatically the information will be given to you. And on the other hand, what about the current affairs, the crash course, which will be held on the YouTube channel? All you need to do is simply subscribe to our YouTube channel and whenever the classes will go live, you will be given the information. Now, apart from this, how many classes for each of the subjects for Polity, there will be six classes on platform and five classes in YouTube. Indian economy, eight classes on the platform and five classes on the YouTube. Same for all the classes or all the other subjects. Now, there is one more component here, others. Many of you will get be, will be con confused. So, what is this others? Under others, there will be lectures held on reports, various indices. India yearbook, etc. So, total number of classes in case of the platform will be 50 and in the YouTube will be 31. Now, before I go forward and start discussing the first article in this video, I just want to tell you one thing. Many of you will be basically waiting for the classes to start and once the classes will start, some of you will join live on the platform and you will miss out on the YouTube and your thinking will be let the classes be recorded. I will watch it tomorrow. I'll watch it day after tomorrow. But my request to all of you will be, do not wait for anything. Attend the sessions live. Please attend the sessions live. Because once you keep on pushing it backward, let's say after two days, after three days, the number of classes will keep on getting accumulated. You will end up becoming a different collector altogether. So please attend the classes live. With that caveat, let me start the discussion. The first very important article is regarding exports of onion from India to UAE. What are the important points? Let's try and understand. Point number one, India along with many other countries has stopped exporting of onions to international market. Now before you understand why the exports have been stopped, please understand. Point number two will be until very recently, the onion prices in case of Indian market were under control. But in the last couple of months, or let's say in the second half of last year until now, the prices of onion again have started increasing. And citing that, government of India has imposed various restrictions, various measures to control the rise in the prices of onion. For example, government of India has imposed restrictions over exports in the form of imposing minimum export price, 
where in certain price has been decided by the government and below which I repeat below which you are not allowed to export the onions to the international market. Apart from this government also imposed 40% export duties. In addition to this government also sold buffer stocks of onion to the public so that the supply increases and the prices will cool down. And last year last year at the end of the last year government of India announced that they will be banning export of onion and the reason that was cited by government of India was that despite taking various measures such as imposing taxes of 40 percent on the exports the exports are not coming down exports have gone or exports are increasing and that is causing certain shortage in the domestic market and this could lead to higher price rise in case of onion and that is the reason government of India banned export of onion. Now many of you ask me sir is it the first time that any product has been banned to be exported from India of course answer for that will be no. In the last couple of years government of India has imposed various restrictions on various agriculture commodities. For example in the context of rice such kind of measures have been imposed. In the context of sugar, such kind of measures have been imposed. In, in case of wheat also, various measures have been imposed in order to control the rise in the prices in the domestic market itself. Now, is the India the only country which has imposed a ban on the export of onion? Absolutely no. Countries such as Egypt, Pakistan also have imposed the restrictions or they have banned export of onion. Now, this is point number two. Point number three, with India banning exports, it was supposed to be reviewed, the policy was supposed to be reviewed with the starting of the new financial year and government of India has announced that the ban will be continued without any intervention or without any stoppage, without giving any due date, the ban on the export of onion has been continued indefinitely, indefinitely the ban has been continued. Now point number four. Even though government of India has banned export of onion, government has allowed export of onion to some of the countries. For example, we are exporting to Bangladesh, we are exporting to Bhutan, we are exporting to Mauritius, etc. So government is exporting onion to some of the other countries including Bahrain. Point number five, what is the issue all about? why this discussion is taking place which took the headlines in the Hindu newspaper. The issue is very simple. Government of India announced that they would be exporting 14,400 tons of onion to UAE. They would be allowing the export of onion through a cooperative authority by the name of NCEL, National Cooperative Exports Limited through NCEL 14,400 tons of onion would be exported from India to UAE having a quota of 3,600 tons per quarter having a quota of 3,600 tons per quarter which means although for one year it is 14,400 tons in one quarter you cannot export more than 3,600 tons so maximum quota or quantity allowed to be exported in each of the quarter was decided at 3600 tons. In addition to this, government very recently also announced that in addition to the quota of 3600 tons, 10,000 tons of additional onion would be exported to UAE. And this has led to a lot of discussion regarding the policy that is being followed by government of India. What is the issue? What is the concern raised here? The concern which has been raised is from the domestic market onion has been purchased at certain price and it has been exported to UAE where in the retail market it is being sold at a much higher price. For example various experts have quoted the data from the domestic market the onion has been purchased in the range of 12 to 15 rupees per kg and this has been exported and in the UAE retail market the prices are 150 rupees above 150 rupees which means the farmers who have cultivated onion they are being paid very less amount and when these are sold in the retail market in UAE these are sold at a very high price 
which means windfall. There is a huge amount of windfall that is getting accumulated to somebody else, not to the farmer. So this was basically the criticism that was raised against the export of onion which have gone to UAE. Now defending this, there are various arguments which have been provided by NCEL. What are the arguments? Point number one. It has stated that government of India has decided to export these onion to UAE for providing food security, to ensure food security in that country. Point number two. Although it has been purchased, that is onion has been purchased at a lower price, the prices which have been paid by NCEL are much higher than whatever the price is paid by others in the market to the farmers. So they say we are paying much higher compared to what the farmers are receiving when they will sell it to somebody else in the market. Point number three, NCEL says that it is unfair to compare the retail prices against the wholesale prices. In simple terms, farmers when they will sell the crop in the market, they will generally sell at a wholesale market that is a wholesale price and when it will be sold to consumers or the customers, that will be the retail market. So it is not fair to compare the retail prices with the wholesale market prices. So these are some of the arguments which have been provided by NCL and moreover, NCL has clarified that when we basically took the onion the choice or let's say the selection of the exports was done in a very transparent manner. We have not ensured that the windfall will go to some of these and we have not had a let's say selection of these exporters through an opaque process. No, we have followed a transparent process in choosing these exporters. So these are some of the very important points regarding this article given here. Now before I go forward to the MCQ discussion, what is this NCL? Please remember this. NCL is a exporting cooperative. NCL was established very recently by the Ministry of Cooperation and it is being promoted by various cooperatives such as Gujarat Cooperative Milk Marketing Federation, very famously Amul, it is known as Amul. The other cooperatives are uh, Cripco, IFCO, NAFED, etc. So these cooperatives are promoting NCEL. Now let's have a look at a MCQ based question here. Which of the following measures or measure have been undertaken recently by the government to control price rise of onion? Minimum export prices, export duties and export bans. Government very recently has taken all the three measures in order to control the export of onions from India to the rest of the world. So the right option for this question will be all the three statements are correct. All the three statements are correct. Right option will be option C for the question. Now based on this discussion, I've given a descriptive question as well. There is a need for the government to shift from protectionist policy to calibrated trade policy to control food inflation in India. Explain this or elaborate this in 250 words. Now many of the times so these kind of statements which many of you will find very vague Many of you will simply say, sir, I've never come across this statement in a book, etc. These kind of statements are given in the mains examination and you're expected to write an answer to this statement. Now, what is the argument here? I'll take up the next article, but before that, let me give you a nutshell. How do you approach these kind of questions? Very simple. The statement says there is a need for change in the policy of the government. Why? In the last couple of years, whenever there is a discussion about inflation, one factor that has been contributing to inflation has been food inflation, correct? Even RBI very recently spoke about issue of food inflation, which is not, which, which is basically ensuring that the headline inflation or the overall inflation is remaining elevated. So in order to control food inflation, what kind of policies have been undertaken by the government? Some of these policies, many experts argue that these are knee jerk reactions. These are not strategic measures or strategic policies. These are the policies which have been implemented for a temporary relief, knee jerk. Suddenly these policies have been implemented as a reaction to what is happening in the economy. For example, many of the times experts criticize the export restrictions which are imposed by the government, export or import restrictions. For example, 
in case of many of these uh, imports related to agriculture sector such as oils edible oils etc government of india until very recently had high amount of tariffs on the imports or for that matter even for pulses government of india generally imposes high amount of tariffs not just the tariff uh, let's say the, the tariff barriers even the non tariff barriers are imposed by the government in case of imports and exports and whenever in the domestic market inflation rate goes beyond control or the food inflation goes up to certain level government suddenly will implement such policies which will restrict imports as well as exports specifically targeting exports in order to ensure that supply will increase and prices will cool down and what is the objective behind it what is the objective behind it object is very simple government of india says the headline inflation or the food inflation is very high in india i want to control reduce the inflation rate second the customer expenditure that is a household expenditure is going beyond control it is very high for certain commodities the government says i want to provide certain relief to consumers or customers or a common man such as you and me and third government by imposing let's say export restrictions will basically say they want to increase and ensure sustained supply of these commodities in the market for example let's say after couple of months there is a festival coming up and government might simply feel during festival the supply of sugar must be higher should be continued why during the festival the demand will be very high so in order to ensure that the supply is there government will simply impose these kind of restrictions export restrictions these are some of the objectives but having said so as a result of such measures there are certain issues certain problems what kind of issues or problems you can attribute to such policies simple point number 1 if the prices are increasing don't you think the farmers will be able to sell the commodities at a higher price get certain more revenues earn more revenues but by government of india imposing restriction on the exports now they will have to supply it only to the domestic market prices will cool down but the farmers will suffer farmers will not be able to earn sufficient amount of revenues so earnings of the farmers earnings of the farmers will be affected point number 2 whenever such kind of policies are implemented by the government these policies are implemented for a short duration or a medium duration these are not the permanent changes in the policies of exports as well as imports and because of such kind of let's say quick policy decision taking that is very soon or very quickly it will be implemented for a short duration and suddenly it will be withdrawn by the government this creates uncertainty market if this creates volatility in the market and that will have a huge impact on cultivation of the crops investment in warehousing etc etc and point number 3 or the issue third issue regarding such kind of policy of the government will be if government will restrict the export of these crops let's say onion wheat rice etc don't you think the global market suddenly there is a shortage created and the global inflation inflation in the global market will start increasing food security will become an issue in the global market of course right i will agree to your point when most of will simply say sir why should i be worried about global inflation rate for me self interest or the domestic inflation rate is the most important parameter agreed so i have given you the objectives also the positive outcomes as well as issues related to such kind of policies so what is the way forward then how should we move forward we should ensure that we will enter long term policies or long term agreements with other countries in order to ensure supply of commodities will continue into the domestic market for example in the context of pulses in the context of pulses government of india has been signing long term arrangements long term deals with many other countries in order to ensure pulses will be supplied continuously to indian market this will ensure that whatever be the production volatility will get continuous access these kind of long term deals will also provide a hedge against the pricing volatility <coughs> so that is basically the model answer to the question given here let me go to the next article sensex crosses 75000 mark 
and on the right side, the market capitalization of BSE listed companies crosses more than 400 lakh crore rupees or 400 trillion rupees. Both the articles are very important. Let's try and understand. Point number one, the Sensex, that is basically the measurement of movement in the market capitalization of 30 companies under the Bombay Stock Exchange, it has crossed a 75,000 mark. It was launched in 1986. And the basic idea is simple. It will measure the changes in the market capitalization, of course, free float market capitalization of 30 companies. For the first time, for the first time, you remember the years now, 2007, 2014, 2021, 2023, and finally, 2024. In 2024, it has crossed a 400 tri trillion rupees market capitalization. In 2023, it crossed a 300 trillion market capitalization. In 2021, it hit 200 trillion. 2014, it hit 100 trillion. And in 2007, it hit 50 trillion. So these are the milestones in the market capital. I'm sorry, uh, the market capitalization of the Bombay Stock uh, Exchange. Please remember the years. Point number two, even the Sensex has crossed a very important point or let's say the rally it has crossed, that is 75,000 points mark. Now, many of you ask me, sir, what is the importance of both of these numbers? Is there any connection to UPSC? Please understand this. In recent times, there have been a lot of events that have been happening as a result of which the Sensex has crossed more than 75,000 as well as the MCAP has crossed more than 400 trillion rupees. What are these events? UPC can ask your question based on that only. What are these events? Point number one. Point number one. There is a very high confidence on the performance of Indian economy now. In the global market, there is very high confidence regarding the performance of Indian economy. Why? Many experts say that the fundamentals, the fundamentals of Indian economy are very, very strong. If you talk about, let's say, the GDP growth rate, India is one of the fastest growing, one of the fastest growing economy in the global market. Inflation is under control. The value addition is increasing over a period of time. Economy has recovered from the pandemic. After the impact of the pandemic, it is growing at a very faster pace. So one, there is very high confidence regarding the perform performance of Indian economy. Second, India is the fastest growing economy in the world now. Point number three, lot of companies have got listed, lot of the companies have got listed in the last one year itself. The number of companies which have got listed are very high and as a result of this, the MCAP has kept on increasing. Right. Point number four, and many of you will keep on thinking, sir, if the companies will get listed, what is the impact of it? What is the importance of it? Importance is very simple, my dear. When companies will get listed, it simply means there are shareholders. There are people who are purchasing or investors. It could be retail investor. It could be an institutional investor who are shelling out their money and purchasing shares in the market, purchasing equity in the market. That will automatically keep on getting added to the market capitalization. And the fourth very important point is in recent times, many companies, many companies are showing very good indicators of their performance in terms of higher profitability. Higher profitability. And as a result of this higher profitability indicator, there is a very high amount of investment that is going into the equity market now. These are some of the reasons why the Sensex number, point number has increased, crossed beyond 75,000 points. And even the market capitalization has crossed more than 400 trillion rupees. Having said so, are there any issues? Are there any concerns related to this kind of a rally in the stock market? Of course, yes. On the day when the Sensex crossed this particular number of 75,000 points, there was one event or there was one outcome that was seen as an issue or as a concern which will have a big impact on the stock market performance. Now, having said so, I'll give you certain important points, other points that you need to watch out. And basically, if a question is asked, just simply say, yes, these will have an impact on, let's say, the market performance in India. 
point number one the instability the instability in the middle eastern region the instability or the possibility of the war or let's say the events that are taking place in the middle eastern region that will also have a huge impact <clears throat> it will have a huge impact on the performance of various companies as well as the market point number two the double taxation avoidance agreement amendment or the protocol amendment that has been proposed between india and mauritius i'll take this separately just give me a couple of minutes point number three point number three is the federal reserve federal reserve was supposed to or was expected to announce a rate hike but it has not done that as a result of which lot of these foreign portfolio investors fpis lot of these foreign portfolio investors have taken the money out of india and have uh, right basically moved out of india their investments have gone out of india having said so please understand although these are concerns having said so in recent times the domestic institutional investors the iis domestic institutional investors have pumped in huge amount of money and that was precisely the reason why despite having so many concerns the stock market did not experience a steep fall for example the foreign portfolio investors since the month of january this year since january this year have taken out somewhere around 53000 crore worth of investments out of india but on the other side the domestic institutional investors have pumped in more than 1.1 lakh crore rupees i repeat more than 1.1 lakh crore rupees and that is said to be one of the reasons why the stock market indices are not taking a hit despite these events that are happening right uh, around the world which should have had an impact on the stock market so these are certain points one more point is a dta between india and mauritius i'll take it up after this don't worry now based on this discussion i've given a mcq here with reference to india consider the following statements retail investors through dmat account can invest in treasury bills and government of india debt bonds in the primary market of course yes if you have a dmat account you can invest in these instruments the negotiated dealing system order matching nds om is a government securities a trading platform of the reserve bank of india please understand this rbi has a platform called as nds om using nds om you can trade your instruments in the secondary market second statement is correct central depository services limited is jointly promoted by reserve bank of india and the bombay stock exchange third statement is wrong it is not promoted by reserve bank of india right so there are many banks along with the bombay stock exchange they promote cdsl and some of you might be worried sir what is a cdsl please understand whenever you open a dmat account whenever you open a dmat account you will open it with the two depository system or depository service providers one it has to be either cdsl central depository service limited or else it has to be with nsdl it has to be with the cdsl or nsdl what is basically the depository services function whenever you purchase instruments somebody will have to maintain safe keep these instruments if you sell these instruments somebody has to transfer these instruments from one dmat account to another dmat account so what is the function of cds cdsl or nsdl this is precisely the function but please understand this many of you will basically now ask me sir i have a dmat account i have a dmat account using which i'll trade but i i have dmat account with icici bank i have a dmat account with a stock broker but i i do not have a dmat account with cdsl as well as nsdl argument is simple these depository services companies or entities they will have a tie up with other institutes who are called as primary dealers and now you will open dmat accounts with the primary dealers that's a basic idea so third statement is wrong first and second are correct right option for the question will be option b one and two only now i said there is one more article or one more news that's very relevant for civil services india and mauritius double taxation avoidance agreement dtaa india mauritius 
double taxation avoidance agreement. Now, what is the issue all about? Let's try and understand. Point number one, India and Mauritius signed a double taxation avoidance agreement many decades ago. That is basically in 1982, India and Mauritius signed a double taxation avoidance agreement. This agreement was amended back in the year 2016. And now, very recently, it has been made public. It has been made public that one more amendment has been proposed. This is yet to be ratified. This is yet to be notified. Please understand. It is just that there is a protocol which has been signed by both the countries, that is uh, the Mauritius as well as the government of India. They have signed a protocol. According to that, now the double taxation avoidance agreement between both of these countries will stand amended. But again, I repeat, I reiterate the point, it is yet to be ratified, it is yet to be notified. Why is this point so important? It is important because until and unless it is notified by the government, it is notified by the authorities, it will not come into force. Please remember that. Now, point number two, what is the issue all about? Why there is so much of a discussion? Why is that the announcement of DTA amendment between these two countries led to huge outflow of foreign investment. Reason is simple. Whenever the countries will sign double taxation avoidance agreement, the taxation powers will be distributed, be distributed between two countries. For example, let's say there are two countries A and B. If both of these countries sign a double taxation avoidance agreement, both of the governments will distribute taxation powers amongst themselves. Some of the taxation powers will be given to government of country B. And some of them or remaining will be given to the government of country A. And one of the reason why we receive lot of investments from Mauritius, I repeat, one of the reason why we receive or I should say main reason why we receive lot of investments from Mauritius is because of the double taxation avoidance agreement itself. And the issue that has been raised and why this has been amended now is that government of India is concerned and many other countries around the world are concerned regarding the tax treaties uh, uh, about the same issue. The government of India is concerned that there is a treaty shopping that is happening, there is a round tripping that is happening and as a result of this, there is a tax avoidance or evasion, tax avoidance or evasion as a result of which government of India is not able to collect right amount of taxes. The revenues, tax revenues that the government is supposed to collect, they are not able to collect it. All of this is associated with one more concept called as base erosion and profit shifting, BEP. Yes, please remember that. Base erosion and profit shifting. What is this base erosion and profit shifting? The investors or let's say the companies or in simple terms the taxpayers will abuse the taxation systems, will use the loopholes in the taxation systems of two different jurisdictions, two different countries and will end up paying, paying very less amount of taxes, will end up paying negligible amount of taxes. That is base erosion and profit shifting. In order to counter this BEPS, because if the taxpayers will abuse the taxation system, obviously the governments will be able to collect lesser amount of tax revenues. To reduce this abuse of the taxation system, many countries around the world have come under the concept called as BPS Action Plan. BPS Action Plan. Under BPS Action Plan, there are totally 15 actions or 15 areas that are supposed to be covered. India is signatory. India is a member to this particular BPS Action Plan. And going forward with the same idea, there is action plan number six, action plan number six, under which government of India now says we will amend double taxation avoidance agreement treaty that we have with Mauritius. Now, many of you ask me, sir, if there is amendment, what will happen? Reason is simple. Under this amendment, what has been proposed is, remember this particular term, PPT, your favorite term, PPT. That is, many of you will be concerned about PPT. Sir, where do I get your PPT of this class? Where do I get your PPT of current affairs? So, very easy to remember. PPT. PPT stands for Principal Purpose Test. Principal Purpose Test. 
and what does this principal purpose test say if there is an investor who has invested from mauritius in india and one of the primary objectives of this investment being rooted into india one of the primary objectives principal objective is to avoid taxes to get the tax benefits of the treaty in such cases the tax benefits will not be provided i'll repeat it understand this carefully if one of the principles or one of the objectives principal objective of rooting investment from mauritius into india is to get the tax benefit of this treaty then the tax benefit will not be provided which means let's say hypothetically if you are a tax official i am a investor who has invested from mauritius in india on this income there is a tax benefit that is let's say i am supposed to pay taxes at 0% according to the dta then they will evaluate under the ppt that is principal purpose test and if the tax official that is you are in this example if you come to a conclusion that one of the primary objectives of me investing in india was to basically get the tax benefit of the treaty then you will not allow me to get the tax benefit whatever tax rate is applicable you will accordingly impose the tax rates and collect it this is basically the idea of a principal purpose test so the concern amongst many of the investors has been there is no clarity there is no clarity how this test will be imposed and evaluated there is no clarity so the concerns are simple one there is no clarity regarding application of the provisions now point number 2 point number 2 will there be any grand fathering clause remember this will there be any grand fathering clause what do you mean by grand fathering clause imagine imagine let's say government of india will announce this amendment right now protocol has been signed but let's say government of india will announce it and from 1st of april 1st of april 2025 this will come into force this will be implemented now the question is will the implementation will be retrospectively done from the 1st of april or will it will be done prospectively and if you are confused retrospectively means no doubt it will be implemented from 1st of april but what if the investment was done before 1st of april in uh, in india will that also be covered under this so will it be applied retrospectively or prospectively they want clarity they need clarity regarding this so these are some of the concerns which have been raised by various investors especially foreign portfolio investors and that is one of the reason why there is a huge outflow of investments from indian market to outside market in the last couple of days having said so having said so various tax authorities or even experts have commented saying that this is just a protocol which has been signed protocol has been signed now it is not being implemented it is yet to be notified faqs might be issued by the tax authorities so that is the argument they are simply saying a protocol has been signed we are yet to ratify this and after that we are yet to notify it as long as it is not notified the investors do not have to be worried about it investors do not have to be worried and second regarding grandfathering clause whether if if your investment is done before the date from which it will be implemented whether that will be covered or it will be exempted etc that information will be provided to you why are you concerned right now let it be ratified first then all the clarifications will be provided so these are certain very important points regarding the india mauritius double taxation avoidance agreement amendment signing of the protocol now let me go forward next article is regarding restructuring of cpi consumer price index what are the important points central government has announced a survey central government has announced a survey the name of the survey is very simple market survey and what what the government is trying to achieve here logic is simple earlier i'm pretty sure you have come across a survey called as household consumption expenditure survey hces very recently the results of the survey that was conducted for one year the results were announced government is conducting the survey again for the year right for one more year the government is conducting the survey so once the second round data for the household consumption expenditure survey is out point number 
along with this the government is conducting one more survey called as a market survey what is the importance of market survey in case of market survey government will go to certain markets right not difficult government will go to certain areas that is markets the number that has been provided is 2800 physical markets now the surveyors will be sent to these markets and they'll collect the data regarding how much money will be spent by the households on each of the items on different items and based on the survey results of the market survey as well as the second round of HCEs, the government is thinking of restructuring restructuring CPI there is a need to restructure CPI reason is very simple from one duration to another duration from one time period to another time period how the money will be spent by the households on what goods the money will be spent by the households number will keep on changing number will keep on varying so whatever basket we have under CPI now it was a done weightages were given for the commodities or the groups in the basket taking the survey which was conducted back in the year 2011 now we are in the year 2024 should we not restructure the basket should we not change the composition of the basket of course yes, we should do it why what if i were to see if if i were to give a very simple example what if the households on an average are spending much higher amount of money on fuels now and much lower amount of money on food consumption compared to the earlier reference period so weightages should be changed and what if some of the commodities which were part of the basket earlier because under the cpi basket please understand under cpi basket currently for overall we have 299 items 299 commodities including goods as well as services now before i go forward how many commodities are there under the wpi basket what is the answer please do let me know in the comment section how many commodities in the wpi okay now cpi for headline cpi for all of india combined cpi we have 299 commodities now some of these commodities the expenditure done by the households might be very less or they might have stopped consuming these commodities so there is a need to restructure cpi and that is exactly what is given in the article so in a nutshell very simple government is conducting the market survey along with this there is already a hce as a second round which is being conducted once the data for both of the surveys is out government will be restructuring cpi and that is actually required and in case of cpi it is expected that it is expected that rather than having 299 commodities will have 320 commodities and the weightages for the commodities will also keep on changing or might change based on the survey data of both the the market survey as well as hces these are certain important points important for the preliminary examination please make a note of this based on this i have given an mcq consider the following statements the weightage of food in consumer price index is higher than in the wholesale price index the statement is true correct by the way in case of cpi the weightage that is given is 45.8 percent many of the books or many of the authors will round it off and say 46 percent whereas in case of wpi the food weightage is somewhere around 25 percent so first statement is correct weightage of food in cpi is higher the wpi does not capture changes in the prices of services which cpi does absolutely correct in case of wpi we do not include services whereas in case of cpi whatever the number is there in the basket it is including goods as well as services third one reserve bank of india has now adopted wpi as its key measure of inflation and to decide on changing the key policy rates no earlier rbi used to take policy decisions based on wpi but today we do not use a wpi we rather use a cpi as a nominal anchor please remember this rbi uses cpi as a nominal anchor for decision making cpi is actually used now so first statement is true second statement is true right option for the question will be option a now before i go forward some of you look at it and say sir 
why are you giving numbers like this today the upc pattern has changed right your questions are outdated etc my dear i have taken this question paper from the early year upsc examination civil service examination 2020 and the new pattern where only one statement is true only two statements are true you can use that also the quality or let's say the difficulty level of the question will increase because you cannot use elimination method anywhere if the new pattern is actually used but anyways this is a question from the previous paper or previous year next article last mile transmission is a big hurdle to policy rate cut now what is the issue what is the, what is the importance of this article let me start in the last couple of monetary policy reviews i'm pretty sure all of you must have observed it rbi is not changing repo rates rbi changed repo rate in the last two years specifically from may 2022 to the first quarter of 2023 till then right till then rbi has reduced repo rate rbi cut repo rate by 250 basis points the repo rate was cut by reserve bank of india by 250 basis points but since last one year i'm just rounding off don't worry since last one year rbi has not changed the repo rate at all it has kept the repo rate stagnant at around 6.5 percent what is the reason why is rbi not changing repo rate why did rbi take so many months right uh, even though inflation rate was so high why is rbi taking so much time to reduce the repo rate the issue is very simple here understand this very carefully rbi says i can reduce the repo rate or i can change the repo rate no issues but the impact of it there is a, a very high doubt regarding the efficient impact of it in simple terms there is something called as a monetary policy transmission monetary policy transmission mpt what do you mean by monetary policy transmission idea is simple here if rbi will reduce the repo rate if rbi will cut the repo rate we also expect the banks to reduce the repo rate and as a result of this more loans will be issued new loans more loans at lower interest rate will be issued and generally to measure this there is a term called as weighted average lending rate weighted average lending rate if if the rbi reduces repo rate and the banks also reduce the repo rate very close to the reduction done by rbi we generally say it will increase it will increase the number of loans that are issued because the weighted average lending rate reduction will also be very close or very close to the repo rate reduction but what rbi now is saying is two very important points although it has right it has changed the repo rate it has changed the repo rate by 250 basis points in the last two years again i'm saying it increased because of higher inflation rate but after that it has stopped it has basically stopped at 6.5 percent it has not changed after that although rbi has changed the repo rate by 250 basis points after that it has not changed because of two reasons one the monetary policy transmission rbi says right, it is not as per the expectation of rbi it has changed the repo rate by 250 basis points but on the other side the weighted average lending rate has been changed by 185 basis points by all the banks put together point number two why is this happening why is this happening why is that if repo rate changes by 250 but the weighted average lending rate changes only by 185 basis points it doesn't make any sense reason is simple there are different lending rate regimes which are used please remember this there are different lending rate regimes which are used by the banks now you will be confused sir what is this lending rate regime whenever a bank will provide a loan let's say for a company or a corporate they will charge a rate of interest and when the bank will provide a loan for retail borrowers msmes etc they will charge a rate of interest when the bank will provide loan to a corporate the rate of interest charged is based on a concept called as marginal cost of funds based lending rate mclr marginal cost of funds based lending rate which was implemented by rbi from 1st april 2016 on the other side whenever the banks will provide loans to the retail borrowers such as you me msme etc 
द रेट ऑफ इंटरेस्ट चार्ज इज बेस्ड ऑन अ कॉन्सेप्ट कॉल्ड एस एक्सटर्नल बेंच मार्किंग एक्सटर्नल बेंच मार्किंग एंड दोज आर वंडरिंग एम सी एल आर इज इंटरनल बेंच मार्किंग एंड राइट देर वॉज अ कमिटी विच वॉज सेटअप आई वॉन्ट यू टू आंसर टू दैट पर्टिकुलर क्वेश्चन वॉट इज द नेम ऑफ द कमिटी टेल मी द नेम ऑफ द कमिटी विच रेकमेंडेड एक्सटर्नल बेंच मार्किंग फॉर इंडिया और लेट्स ए टू रिजर्व बैंक ऑफ इंडिया टू बी इंप्लीमेंटेड इन इंडिया सो इन केस ऑफ एक्सटर्नल बेंच मार्किंग ऑल द ऑप्शन हैव बिन प्रोवाइडेड मोस्टली द बैंक यूज रेपो रेट मोस्टली द बैंक यूज रेपो रेट रेपो रेट इज यूज बाय मोस्ट ऑफ द बैंक to adjust their lending rate argument is simple here i said rbi has increased repo rate from 2022 in order to control inflation and when rbi increases repo rate automatically the rate of interest on the loans given for the retail borrower the rate of interest keeps on increasing and on the other side mclr marginal cost of funds based lending rate here the rate of interest is decided based on the cost of the deposits cost of the deposits for the bank so that is the reason in case of this the rate of interest that is changed by the bank it is very slow it is lagging whereas in case of the external benchmarking because most of the banks link their lending rate to the repo rate rate of interest changing is very much right on a basis or let's say it is following the changes in the repo rate it is moving very faster here it is lagging very very slow here and rbi says around 40% of the deposits around 40% of the loans sorry around 40% of the loans which are issued by the banks are under the rate of interest which is under mclr which means the pricing on these loans will be very slow compared to the other loans which are there under the external benchmarking and that is a precise reason rbi is very hesitant in terms of changing repo rate and has maintained the same repo rate for many many reviews as of now so these are certain very important points please be very very careful regarding the lending rate regimes now next article very very important as far as i'm concerned one more taxation issue angel tax valuation method solely assesses choice a ruling has been issued by delhi high court now what is the side of a angel tax let's try and understand point number 1 there are investors in a company or let's say a startup other than saying a company a startup there are certain types of investors who are referred to as angel investors angel investors and whenever angel investors will invest in a startup it's very risky because the startups require lot of money to expand their operations the angel investors who are generally the individual investors who are high net worth individuals will invest in a startup for returns in terms of equity in terms of ownership etc they are taking a huge amount of a risk and when angel investors will invest in a company there is right there is according to income tax officials there is certain gains that is earned by the angel investors and on such gains i'll tell you how the gains are calculated on such gains income tax officials will impose a tax which is called as an angel tax which is referred to as an angel tax now what is this angel tax let's say hypothetically there is a angel tax i'm sorry a, there is a angel investor by the name a a will invest in a company and right because this is an angel investor certain amount of equity certain amount of ownership is given by the company to the angel investor whatever be the percentage of ownership don't worry this ownership please understand basically is given because the money has flown or the investment has gone from the investor a into the company xyz so certain equity percentage of equity or certain number of shares of the company are given to the angel investor point number 1 point number 2 now whatever investment is done by the angel investor in a company and how much equity is given it will be based on the value of the startups the value valuation of a startup come to the valuation whenever you talk about valuation of a startup here in terms of taxation please remember there is a requirement to calculate what is the fair market value fmv what is the fair market value what is the value of the company 
based on this the investment has been attracted and certain number of shares have been given now whenever you calculate fair market value there are two different ways one is called as discounted cash flow method discounted cash flow method and the other one is net asset value method nav net asset value method now should you learn about discounted cash flow as well as a net asset value for gs paper 3 absolutely no some of the students who are already the graduates of commerce graduates are learning ca they'll be very happy with these terms but other students who are from different backgrounds who wants to write gs paper 3 simply remember there are two methods one is a discounted cash flow and the second one is nav generally what happens is when an angel investor will invest and certain ownership or equity is given the companies use a discounted cash flow method to provide certain equity that is let's say hypothetically according to the discounted cash flow method for investment that is done let's say worth 1000 rupee angel investor will invest let's say 1000 rupee in a startup xyz and based on this method per share value will be counted as 100 rupee and xyz will issue right let's say 10 shares xyz will issue 10 shares right to the investor again don't worry about exact numbers how this will be calculated etc so 10 shares are issued a will have 10 shares now income tax officials will use another method net, net asset value method and they will simply come to a conclusion per share value here per share value is not 100 rupee rather it is just let's say 60 rupee so understand this the income tax officials have used one more method and they have arrived at a value per share but here the company has used one more method to arrive at value of per share that is issued to the angel investor and now income tax officials will say right the investor has already made right a profit or let's say extra earnings of 40 rupees actual valuation is 60 but they have been valued at 100 rupee shares have been valued at 100 rupees so there is an earning of 40 rupee on that tax would be imposed i know slightly complicated but you don't worry about all of the calculations logic is very simple there are two different methods income tax officials will use one method company might use one more method as a result of this if income tax officials feel that what has been given what value has been given per share to the angel investor if it is higher then angel investor has to pay taxes the investor has to pay taxes to the company which is i'm sorry to the government which is basically called as angel tax this is called as angel tax now what has happened there is a company right don't worry about the company name there's a company which has issued certain number of shares income tax officials have used a different method and have imposed angel tax now this company has appealed against it has appealed against it to appellate to tribunal it was not overturned now this has gone to delhi high court right the matter has gone to delhi high court and what has the delhi high court issued in the form of order simple delhi high court says the income tax authority the income tax authority according to the law according to the income tax act because the angel tax was introduced under section 56 of income tax act it was proposed in the finance bill of 2012 and was introduced under income tax act so the delhi high court says according to the provision the income tax officials or income tax department cannot use one more method to calculate what is the fair market value of a startup all that the income tax department can do is once a startup will give the evaluation or valuation methodology what has been used they will give certain valuation to ITAT sorry uh, income tax department whatever method has been used the income tax department can appoint one more expert an external authority can be appointed an external expert can be appointed to check whether the methodology used is correct or not for the assessment for the valuation of the company whether the methodology used whether they have followed correct method or not that can be done cross check can be done by the income tax department but the income tax department by its own cannot use one more method to calculate the valuation of the company so this order has been issued by the delhi high court regarding the concept of angel tax so these are certain very important articles that i wanted to discuss with you people in this week's video 
If you like these initiatives, hit the like button. If you yet to subscribe to our YouTube channel, kindly do it right now. Thank you. Have a great day.